Coming up on Market to Market, the government report that analysts have been pointing to for weeks drops. We decipher the data and look at where we go from here. Commodity Market Analysis with Naomi Bloom and Matthew Bennett, next. What's next doesn't happen by chance. It happens when researchers and farmers work together to solve tomorrow's agronomic challenges. We're committed to creating what's next because a pioneer, our name is our mission. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. This is the Friday, January 12th edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Paul Yeager. This week has dramatically changed the weather pattern in the grain states. At one point Thursday and Friday, every state in the lower 48 had some form of weather watch or warning. The Midwest was socked in with not one, but two snow systems, while thunderstorms and more severe weather moved across the south. No matter the forecast, the USDA issued one of their most anticipated reports of the year. We'll get to our panel in a moment, but first the numbers. The nearby wheat contract lost 19 cents, while March corn dropped 14 cents. Conab lowered production levels, but not enough to turn the soy complex higher. The March contract declined 32 cents, and March meal shed 7.30 per ton. March cotton expanded by 99 cents per hundredweight. Over in the dairy parlor, February Class 3 milk futures added 33 cents. The livestock market was higher. February cattle gained 80 cents. March feeders improved 355. And the February lean hog contract went higher by $1.90. In the currency markets, the U.S. dollar index increased six ticks. February crude oil lost 126 per barrel. Comex gold cut off 190 per ounce. And the Goldman Sachs commodity index added almost a point to settle at 538.75. Joining us now are two of our regular market analysts, Naomi Bloom and Matthew Bennett. Naomi, hello. Hi there. Thanks for having me. Hi, Matthew. Hello. Uh, the weather has uh, been a big story. That's one story. But really, it's this report, Naomi. The headline for you today was what? Well, just the fact that the USDA increased yield for both corn and soybeans, even more than what the industry was expecting, was really bearish on markets and then ending stocks, of course, in response, also increased larger uh, the beans were the one that was really substantial, now up to about 280 million metric tons. That was a big jump. And so that weighed on market prices. So bigger production overall, a very bearish report for the corn and bean market. Matt, do you have a different headline? <laughs> uh, she one that much, you can share on TV. Well, yeah, I mean, we got to keep this uh, keep this uh, uh, appropriate. But, you know, you looked at the report and... Uh, Obviously, stocks were high uh, for the quarterly stocks. That first quarter is really hard to gauge. It made sense whenever you saw that they raised yield. But bottom line for a grower that's sitting on a lot of old crop corn, and we know there's a lot of that, it wasn't a good day. Uh, we know that we've got a wall of corn to deal with, uh, even a little bit bigger than what we thought before. 15.3 is going to be the biggest crop uh, that we've ever seen. And it's because you planted uh, over 94 million acres, and we trim that back just a little bit here on this report, but over 94 million acres and maintain a 177 plus yield. That's just uh, phenomenal. So what that tells me moving forward, we've got to understand when they throw out baseline numbers with yields of uh, 180 plus uh, uh, for trend line, that's for real. I mean, if you can raise 177 in the summer of 23, what can you raise in a summer like maybe 2014? You know, you get that kind of weather pattern, you know, and uh, you've got to think that you could have some awfully, awfully good national yields moving forward. Naomi, it's hard to change your planting uh, plan if you've already put some nitrogen down, you're going to corn. However, will this force any acre changes? I think there's going to be definitely some potential for things to switch up. But to your point, if, if fall work was already done on the fields, they're going to stick with corn. Um, the reality with what we have now today, this, this report is the cornerstone for our industry for the next five months. 
And with this report, even if we plant 3 million less acres of corn next year and assume no real changes to demand, we're still dealing with 2 billion bushel carryout. So that negativity is gonna weigh on market and market sentiment. Now, what I did like on the report today, the USDA did raise demand for ethanol and for feed. So that was encouraging. Um, and I think you know, the other thing we have to be thinking about going forward, we still have a safrina crop that needs to get planted and that is 75% of Brazil's total production. So the USDA today did lower the Brazil crop for corn just a little bit regarding the first crop, but what will they do with the safrina crop? So the safrina crop, as you know, is gonna get planted late February into March and the beans were planted late and now this weather's getting a little bit soggier. So now what if those beans get harvested late and even later because of weather than the safrina crop gets planted late? So there's hope for maybe higher prices down the road for producers still holding grain in the bin. But again, the reality goes back to what uh, Matt was saying and what we've been talking about, this 2 billion bushel carryout that's just not going to go away. So if you can see any sort of price recovery here, make sure you're using it to your advantage to be making some cash sales for both old crop and new crop. Matt, I guess I'll force you to find something positive. You got to find something nice to say here. Is there anything? <laughs> One thing that I'll add, uh, cause Naomi did a fantastic job, uh, capping the safrina crop, but the thing is they're planting less acres, you know, corn acres are going to be lower this year. So that gonna, that's gonna make it even more important that a crop that's going to go in the ground a little later than what they would prefer is going to have to have really good help from mother nature. Anytime that crop goes in the ground late, they run into dry season on the heels of pollination and God forbid that dry season be in the midst of pollination. So, uh, yes, you could see, uh, some, some, support, some support there. Uh, the thing is, again, is that if you've got uh, the, the corn in the farmer's hand and you've got this much corn in the farmer's hand, if you get a 20, 30, 40 cent rally, and let's face it, even in the toughest of years, we see rallies occur. But if you see a rally occur, you've got to understand that flat cash price is unlikely uh, to follow along. And it's not because elevators are trying to be uh, uh, jerks, so to speak. It's because they can only handle so much corn. They have to widen bases uh, to restrict the flow of grain. And that's just the way that it's going to work. Producers have to understand, get your offers in, know what you're willing to, to accept. And, and you know what? Your standards may have to be lowered a little bit from what we thought before, because right now uh, you can't paint near as bullish a picture. It doesn't feel as good as what it did a year ago. It's because we've got different situation than a year ago. Matt, you were on uh, the last time and someone took a note. In fact, they uh, gave us a question here uh, off social media. This one came from Facebook. Ronald in Iowa wants to know, Matt, you mentioned a few months ago that it would be that we could be in for a three year bear market with corn. Do you still feel that way? And if you do, what's a range? You know, this feels a whole lot more like the 2015 through 2019 frame time frame than what it does for instance the 21 and 22 and the 23 time frame uh, the thing about corn is that you run prices up high enough and obviously it does a couple of things it it hurts demand uh, to a point and it also encourages production from others around the world because the u.s producer was not the only one that made money in 21 and 22 and so when you're making money you want to do more of what you're doing i mean that's just uh, common sense so uh, is it going to be a three-year bear market i don't know here's the thing if you get corn cheap enough then demand will come in. I would much rather have a demand-led rally than a supply-led rally, but we've got a lot of corn to chew through. When you look at the world stock situation going from 300 million tons to 325 million tons, what that's telling you again is that you're producing more corn than what you're using. That is not a rally-type environment. Mm -hmm. The other thing that's not a rally-type environment is pushing a 2.2 carry out that doesn't typically equate to uh, $5 corn, let alone 450. And so I know we've had some inflation. I know that things have adjusted somewhat, uh, but as a producer, we have to understand that the, this is certainly changing. We have to be prepared for that sort of a, a bear trend. And, and the last thing I'll say, Paul, is that, you know, if this yield uh, would come to pass in the next year or two, uh, you have to be very well prepared of what would a market do, you know, with 90 million acres planted or 91 million acres planted with a 182 yield, because that would not be a good situation from a stock's yeah. perspective and or a price I perspective. Add to please to um, what Matt was saying. Um, I totally agree with what he's saying um, from a pricing standpoint. 
Right now, December corn has really fantastic support at the 450 level. When you go back and look at weekly charts and monthly charts, 450 is really good support. Um, now going forward, building on what Matt said, if we still have these bigger acres, if we have good yield this summer, should 450 support break, then that's when you're looking at the downside of the $4 level come harvest of this coming year in 2024. So you have to be prepared for that mentality. And when you look back at history over the past 20 to 30 years, anytime we had a year or two years of a bull market, there is usually two to five years of a price pitfall that follows. So it is time to start to be prepared for that. See, the only thing that can turn this market around right now, quite frankly, it's up to Brazil and the weather in Brazil and Safrina crop. Our demand for corn is actually not too shabby. It's just that now we have abundant production. Let's look at the bean picture because, Naomi, you wrote uh, earlier this week uh, about a couple of things that caught my attention in soybeans. From this report, did any of your thinking change? Well, the USDA didn't really change demand at all on this report. Um, I'm a little bit encouraged by that because exports, uh, they keep the export demand at 1.7 billion bushels. And as far as sales go, we're at 75% of USDA projections, which is right on the five-year average. So that's at least a little bit encouraging. Um, but what the USDA did today by increasing production, the fact that the carryout has grown, all it takes is that perception of growth and carryout to make prices go lower. Um, one other thing, though, with the soybeans, when you look at the global picture, the USDA did acknowledge that the production in Brazil is not going to be perfect. And there is more room for that to come down. And if they bring that number down for production in Brazil, it's going to happen on the February report. And there's a lot of industry confusion right now as to where is or isn't that crop in Brazil. So that's going to be something else to be watching going forward. Matt, do you see any surprises out of that South American report this week and, and coupling that with the traditionally inconsistent reporting that we get from non-government sources about what's going on there? Like, did it really rain here or is it really that dry there to change your thinking on beans? You know, I mean, Brazil's such a massive country that it's really hard to get a handle on truly what production might look like. You know, you look at some of the different folks that put estimates out. Conab was 155. I felt like USDA is very unlikely to go below 155 uh, with Conab being there. USDA typically stair steps in their way lower on production anyway. I would say they typically are a little bit slower to react, if you will. And sometimes that's served them quite well, actually. But whenever I look at, for instance, uh, total South America. Let's just let's just focus on Brazil and Argentina. You know, Argentina last year had what you would call like a biblical level drought. I mean, it was half of a crop. So 25 million metric tons versus 50, 45 to 50 typically. And so this year, you know, USDA has got them up to 50 after being 48 a month ago. Uh, if you would go ahead and look at that, I mean, you need Brazil to come off of the 160 by 25 million tons actually to get to where Brazil and Argentina are the same as you year ago. And so, um, you know, I hate to be a, a, the bearer of bad news, so to speak, but it's really hard for me to get super friendly uh, from a world standpoint. Yes, demand's still pretty darn good, don't get me wrong. It's just that we're going to have plenty of beans. Uh, Brazil is unlikely, in my opinion, to lose 25 million tons off the 160 uh, that they had a year ago. Uh, I could see them be getting below 150. You've seen estimates all the way down to 130. I think that's excessive. It's a race to the bottom, and I don't necessarily put a lot of stock in those types of numbers. Uh, but I could see us getting below 150. I think if we do, it could be mildly supportive. I just think you got to remember how much higher Argentina is going to be than what they were a year ago. Naomi, when it comes to wheat, uh, part of the reason we're in our situation uh, physically today is this big winter storm and the, it's going to get cold. Is there enough snow cover on this domestic crop to move a market or move a market moving forward, at least the next week with some weather? Right. Something definitely to be monitoring um, the, the crop conditions of our winter wheat here in the country. Some places do have good snow cover, snow cover, others not as much. And we do, of course, have this Arctic chill coming in. But it's not just our country to watch. We have to keep an eye on the Black Sea region, uh, parts of Russia. They're getting some extreme cold as well and Europe. Um, but I think with the report today, the USDA didn't make any real dramatic changes on the global scene. Um, but they did make our carryout lower because of old crop ending stocks going down. So that made new crop beginning stocks lower. The net result, 
ending stocks overall lower. So that is supportive, uh, definitely. And we had lower acres than expected for planted acres. So that also is supportive. Uh, wheat right now kind of maybe starting to wake up a little bit. It's not a bullish story yet by any means, but uh, we're still seeing that March contract able to hang out around the $6 level. That's really encouraging. And we'll see going forward, definitely we're talking about uh, world weather. The funds had been exiting some of those short positions that allowed wheat to have a little bit of lift higher. But another dominating, dominating theme of our industry continues to be that the funds are just really being bullies in the market right now and staying short on their positions in corn and soybeans now and wheat. Um, and we're seeing it over in the dairy parlor as well, short positions. So that's what we have to be dealing with right now. A lot of outside market influences too. Matt, on this wheat market, uh, it seems to be, as of late, the dollar is still a story. Dollar didn't increase as much, but it still is high. What's the weight that the dollar is throwing on wheat right now? You know, I, obviously it's going to make us to where we're not super competitive uh, on the world market. Unfortunately, you know, if the dollar, when the dollar were made a run towards a hundred and we thought, Hey, maybe it's going to go below a hundred. Uh, it certainly was exciting for a lot of us because it would have made our products uh, uh, much more competitive than what we've seen in quite some time, actually. But we stabilized, moved back up into that 102 level. Uh, but as far as wheat's concerned, we're not the cheapest wheat in the world by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, you know, but you look at the world situation and you're going to have less uh, wheat uh, year on year, uh, which is a good thing. I mean, that's the only one of the big three uh, that we're actually seeing that. So we're going to see 11 million me uh, metric tons less wheat, according to the USDA, from a world standpoint. Uh, that's a really good thing. And you continue to see uh, not only wheat stocks, but the stocks to usage ratio, which used to run in excess of 50 percent uh, pretty much all the time, not only domestically, but worldwide, you continue to get lower wheat stocks. And I know they're much bigger than corn stocks and bean stocks. But the thing is, is that as you continue to whittle those down, it makes you more subsequent uh, to one of your major growers having an issue uh, could actually give you a really bullish reaction in the market, which is kind of exciting. So, you know, maybe wheat, uh, as Naomi said, it's not necessarily uh, up and going just yet. But if the wheat market would stabilize and maybe be able to rally somewhat, it could pull corn and beans along with it. We've seen it happen before. Um, let's let's hope that's one of the things that might happen for us again. I knew you had another positive moment in there, Matt. Absolutely. Come on, that's good. Absolutely. Uh, what about on cotton, though? Does that uh, the wheat cotton discussion acreage? Is there anything to that little rally we had this week in cotton? I mean, my personal opinion on cotton, you know, you, you look, for instance, at South America, you talk about whittling down corn acres a little bit. Well, where are some of those acres going? Cotton. And I think that from a world standpoint, you're going to have enough cotton planted, most likely. Uh, yes, cotton seems to have stabilized somewhat. Obviously, in the last year, we've seen times when the, the market was pretty, uh, pretty tough to watch. But, uh, you know, you look in the U.S., I think cotton acres are going to be enough. Uh, I'm not looking for any major rally with cotton cotton. Uh, I, I feel like uh, it's not going to be near as big a player as what I was just talking whenever I was talking about the wheat market. Naomi, you mentioned dairy a couple of moments ago, and we had a question last week, and I told him I would ask it this week. Uh, I said, Naomi's coming. We'll get that. Uh, what is the headwinds there, or is there some tailwinds for this market, especially long term? Uh, dairy complex right now is really mixed. So we have, in, in, in one essence, production has been creeping a little bit lower but production is good enough. And so our export market is down 8% from year ago, but recently we've had some cheese exports on the increase. So there's mixed news going on there right now. I'm a little bit hopeful that maybe this cold weather that's coming through and it is, it is a dandy here in Wisconsin today. Um, maybe that's gonna affect milk production uh, in the coming weeks because it looks like this cold is here to stay for a bit. Um, but again, mixed news right now in the dairy complex. And I feel like that's part of the reason why milk prices are struggling at the moment. There's nothing that's really friendly, over the top friendly. Um, but at the same time, because production levels overall are a little bit lower than years past, it's keeping the market supported, but at lower values. So I would say probably look for some sideways trade going forward. Some of the spring contracts are trading still in the $17 area. If 17 can hold, that would be great. If it can't, then probably look for a correction lower, closer to 1650 on those spring contracts. 
Matt, on live cattle, she mentioned uh, Naomi mentions the weather a little bit. Uh, it's gonna. This is what is expected finally in winter. But is there is there a, again a weather story to be had in live cattle or feeders for that matter, or is this just strictly a we're still kind of doing some discovery from these highs that we've had. Yeah. I mean, you've stabilized the live cattle market. You look at the chart, obviously you fell 30 some dollars. I mean, it is, it's a pretty massive sell off. And then we've kind of etched out a nice little uptrend here. Whenever I look at cattle overall, a couple of things occur to me. Yes. Last year it was well documented 65 year low in total herd inventory in the U S uh, but when you're running cattle on feed numbers and placements where they've been cattle on feed at 106, 105, what are you doing as far as the total herd inventory is concerned? Well, you're whittling it down just a little bit more actually. So as you get on out past, Oh, I'm going to say spring time frame, uh, last year, a year ago, most of the folks in the West where the bulk of the cattle are, they really didn't have a choice as to whether or not to sell those gals or to put them, uh, you know, on feed. And so they were selling them for what, sixteen, eighteen hundred dollars Who would blame a person for doing such a thing? This year, they have more of a choice because they have more pasture. And with that being the case, some will choose to retain heifers. I think your cattle on feed numbers will dip precipitously at times in 24, probably on out towards the summer. And when that happens, I, I don't know if you make new highs, but I, th I certainly think that no one is going to want to be short going into something like that. And that's part of the reason the cattle market seems some support in here. Naomi, what do you see in feeders? Is that consistent with what Matt was saying about live cattle? Yeah, our calf crop down 2% over this last year, and it's supposed to be down again into 2024. So we know that there's been um, increases in, um, you know, numbers coming from Canada and from Mexico as far as imports go. Here's the deal. Old news. We already know about it. I don't know that we're going to have a reason to go back up and retest the highs that we saw in 2023, but we're still in a long-term uptrend. I feel like for the next couple of weeks, at least the market's going to start to trade sideways. It's going to really look to see where the demand is. It's going to look to see how our exports are doing. We've got a cattle on feed report coming up next Friday and a huge cattle inventory report coming up on January 31st. Those are going to give us the glimpses of information going into next year. But the overall theme continues to be that we have a smaller herd and those things do not that just get rebuilt that fast, you know, and we, we haven't really seen signs that the herd is regrowing. So um, so I, I feel like the cattle market going to just trade sideways here for the short term. I think our long term uptrend is still supported quite well. And then we'll get some fresh data at the end of the month. Uh, Naomi on line or on the hogs, as we actually I had to double check, we actually went higher again uh, for a week. Any positive, more positive news ahead there for hogs? Well, um, not really positive news. Production is still overall higher in general, and we are still trending lower in the bigger picture. But we did have a nice recovery bounce. I think part of it is speculative trading. Um, part of it is just, you know, we're heading into that winter time frame, and maybe we start to see demand pick up a little bit in terms of, um, like for me personally, I'm going to be putting some pork in the crock pot later. And I think we'll start to see some of that demand pick up the pace too. But also when I think about winter, it makes me a little bit nervous of herd disease. Uh, it makes me a little bit nervous that we see some of those viruses come back into play. Mm -hmm. uh, but the overall theme for the hog market continues to be larger production. Production is supposed to still be a little bit larger into 2024. But I feel like the hog producers are really trying to do something about it. Um, and, and we're going to keep an eye on our exports too. Okay. Matt, Naomi, you both get 30 seconds to, to give me something as a producer from today's report, Matt, that I need to do that. I'm obviously have missed the boat on, but something I can recover and have again, something positive in this final uh, 30 seconds. You know, I mean, the main thing for me is we have to have a plan moving forward. Uh, it's costing us a lot to hold on to these commodities. Interest costs are high, whether it's in your bin at home or whether it's on storage, you know, it's costing you money just simply to own. So you have to have a game plan moving forward. Are you going to get what you want out of your crops? Probably not. And I think uh, the sooner we come to those realizations, the easier it's going to be for us to put those offers in place and be able to take advantage of them. Naomi, you're 30 seconds. Yep. So today we saw corn uh, complete a head and shoulders objective to the downside of 440 in the March contract. So check that off the box. 
The March beans did a swing objective lower by a billing um, going down to the $12 area. So we can check that off the box. Some technical objectives were met, were oversold. I think we'll see a recovery bounce here at some point. Something will spook the market higher. Funds will take some profits, but use whatever kind of recovery rally we get to make sure you are focused on your cash sales, old crop, and new crop. All right. We'll leave it at that. Thank you so very much, Matt. Thank you, Naomi. Hold it right there, though. We're going to pause this analysis and continue our discussion in our Market Plus segment. You can find both the analysis and plus on our website of markettomarket.org. Let us help beat those winter doldrums with some podcast offerings. Each week, we have three different offerings, the analysis, which you just heard, the Market Plus, and every Tuesday, the MTOM Show. Next week, we look at how a small insect is making a big impression on the landscape. Thank you so very much for watching. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa PBS, which is solely responsible for its content. What's next doesn't happen by chance. It happens when researchers and farmers work together to solve tomorrow's agronomic challenges. We're committed to creating what's next. Because a pioneer, our name is our mission. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today.